just for some introductions, my name is Alicia Mandak, and I am the Senior Academic Counselor with College Arts and Sciences. Um, and I, in addition to my main advising duties, I coordinate the peer advising program, which we will talk about in this uh, presentation. Yeah. And hello, um, my name is Joanna Dressel, and I am the Peer Advising Program Assistant in the College Arts and Sciences. Um, I was also a peer advisor last year when I was um, finishing my final year on American. I just graduated with a sociology bachelor's. And good morning, my name is Jimmy Ellis. I'm the manager of student success and retention. I work in the Office of the Vice Provost of Undergraduate Studies. So just to give you a goal of, of what we hope to do for this session um, is to really highlight what we've learned about the first year experience. There's sort of two, two goals here. Um, highlight what we know about the first year experience at AU, um, but really from what we've learned through our peer advising program um, and really about the power of building intentional peer connections and giving this information in, in order to illuminate ways that you all can enhance your work with first-year students, both inside and outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so before this presentation, uh, we had emailed out to the folks who had signed up um, just a question that we wanted you to reflect on a little bit, and we wanted to, to open up with a little bit of a discussion of what you all, what are some challenges that you face in working with first-year students? So if anybody would be uh, willing to share, we would love to hear. of resilience and a lack of adapt adaptability to, to sort of this new institution and how this new system works. Yep, great, thank you. Yes. sense of, you know, the expectations being laid out ahead of time, clear, but then students not, no understanding that they, that the expectation is to, to meet that. Yeah, an exception being given. Graciously said. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Overestimation of what they can, what they can take on. Mm -hmm. um, well, great. Well, thank you all. Um, that helps to kind of give us uh, a little bit of sense of, of what brought you here. Um, so we will to start. I want to just give um, a little bit of information about the the peer advising program because this is where a lot of the information that we're going to be talking about um, has been uh, has is coming from. So the peer advising program, this is something that I created when I first started here as an advisor um, in the summer of 2008. And it was originally um, because of a call for innovative ideas of how to work with a large incoming class. That was a year that there was a, a significant increase in enrollment, and so um, the advising office was sort of tasked with, okay, well, what, what can we do to support these students? And I uh, proposed this idea uh, because of my background. I actually became a peer advisor when I was a, a student in my undergraduate institution, and it <laughs> meant a lot to me. And so I, that was sort of, I was very driven at that time to say, I'm gonna do this, and so I just did it. Um, and uh, the, the focus of our, of our program, so you can see the mission that's, that's written up there, but it's really to, to help bridge that transition between high school and college. Um, and that gap that, that tends, we tend to see with first year students of like what you're talking about, sort of this lack of skill sets that they need to really successfully navigate um, this institution. And so our mission uh, is to facilitate that process to create successful undergraduate students in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, 
um, and a little bit about the program structure. So this is how the program has been structured since fall 2012. Um, we have four peer advisors. They're all upperclassmen in the College of Arts and Sciences, and they come from various backgrounds. Um, we also have a program assistant, and this program assistant is a former peer advisor. Um, Joanna is uh, the current program assistant um, and was a former peer advisor. And their caseloads, um, they're advised students, and they're about uh, approximately about 100 first-year CAS students that they um, that they have on their caseload. Um, and just a little bit about their activities. So the crux of what peer advisors do is that one-on-one -on -one advising. So um, uh, they reach out to all of their first-year students and invite them to come in for um, appointments and really to kind of do that check-in about how things are going. Um, there's sort of two-fold uh, things that they do or two-fold tasks that they do in those appointments to check in on their transition, um, just kind of have that initial conversation of tell me how things are going, what is it like living on campus, um, but then also building in the different tools that we need them to know in terms of how to read your degree audit report, making sure that they understand the general education program, um, understanding the college writing uh, uh, program requirements, that kind of thing. So those appointments, they have sort of two purposes. They also are responsible for developing um, student-focused programming, so they plan different events for students across campus. Um, they have a blog and they're really active on social media. Um, and they also provide other various <laughs> support roles for the CAS Advising Office. Uh, for example, we have pre-registration workshops and our peer advisors assist us with that. Um, the major uh, games, the major fair that we do um, in the spring semester, peer advisors are really um, important in the planning of that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second point there in that I really want to underscore is that really the growth and development of this program has been because of the ideas of peer advisors. My, the, in running this program, what has always been very central to it was allowing the ideas of the peers to take the lead. Um, and this is what ensures that this program stays in tune with the first year experience. And really why we have this information now is because I constantly will be asking the peers, what ideas do you have and what do you see students need? Um, and they come up with some really innovative ideas. Um, these are just three examples. Um, they did a late night breakfast, but they called it Breakfast with Champions. and they. Um, you use that as a way to talk about the importance of getting involved on campus, and they brought in different student leaders across campus to talk about their involvement. Uh, we did a photo blog um, where we had, uh, in the quad, we had students write on a whiteboard their advice to first year students, and then they took a picture with it, and we put it on our blog, and that gave us one of our highest viewership. Um, even this, this semester, last semester, uh, one of our peers, she came up with an idea of coffee and confidence, and she just came in one day and said, Alicia, I was thinking what I needed as a first year student was some tips about confidence, because I was not confident at all. And so they, they did a little uh, session about um, confidence and some tips over coffee. Um, and so this is really kind of what is why we have the information about, about first year um, students, is because of making sure that their ideas are taking the lead. Um, so to go into now really what our methods were and what, we, what we've been learning through all of this, um, we have sort of three things that we will highlight. Um, the first is a feedback survey that we did uh, for the students uh, for this fall 2015. Uh, qualitative approach, which Joanna will take um, a, the lead on, and then Jimmy will take the lead on the retention approach as well. Um, so with the, uh, with the feedback survey, so this was uh, every <laughs> first year student that met with a peer advisor this fall semester were sent a feedback survey. And we really wanted to get at this sense of what they were learning uh, with peer advising. And so they were sent it after initial meeting and we had a, a pretty high response rate of 45%. Um, and this infographic, which hopefully this will work, um, this is something actually that one of our peer advisors, our current peer advisors created. And so again, really making sure that the peers are taking the lead because they can do some really impressive things. I have no idea how she did this, but she did. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can see here in terms of what we were just interested in looking at is their understanding of uh, their degree requirements, uh, how the advising system works in the College of Arts and Sciences, their awareness of campus resources, and their comfort with choosing um, uh, the, a major. And kind of evaluating before and after peer advising. And you can see some nice positive um, impacts on each of those. And then this last part here, we kind of just wanted to get a sense that you know, what they thought about their peers and um, overwhelmingly the sense of that they really like peer advising and would, would recommend it to a friend. And a nice little quote here at the bottom um, that really highlights uh, their experience after talking with the peer advisor. Um, so this was just sort of the start of our investigation into what we're learning about um, how this is uh, working with first year students. So Joanna is going to talk about her qualitative 
you approach. And um, sh as uh, undergraduate here, her senior thesis was an oral history project that she did in sociology. And so when she moved into the program assistant role, I said, Joanna, would you <laughs> like to do some oral history work on peer advising? Um, and so this is really pulled from, from her own research interest and really giving her an opportunity to develop the skill sets that she wants to build um, professionally as well. So I will let Joanna take over. Thank you, yeah, thank you, Lucia. Um, so as was mentioned, we started this project just because we started getting a little bit interested in the impact that the program had on students and um, how, who the students were that were going through our program. Um, and so that turned into uh, an IRB approved project that we are presenting now. Um, so we did six individual interviews, um, four of which were with current students that are going through the peer advising program, one former program assistant, and then one former peer advisor. Um, and we also did one sort of um, focus group with the four current peer advisors that we have working with us right now. Um, and then the way that we're going to present our findings on this are going to be through uh, going over self-understanding that students have of their first year experience, some of the common challenges that they really seem to be um, having in that experience, as well as the unique role that these peer relationships have within this whole um, understanding and the challenges within the experiences. Um, so our first element of the self-understanding issue is this idea of prestige and opportunity. Um, and I came up with this because students are always reporting that they're very excited to come to AU under this idea that it's a very prestigious place to be and that they're very excited to join in this community that has so much opportunity. Um, so everyone cites this internship statistic. There's often a lot of incorrect citing of what the internship statistic is, but they'll mention the bus ads, they'll mention other advertisement models. Um, but really in a way that makes them that they chose AU for that <laughs> opportunity, um, as well as the urban environment, everything that you can do here, and the national and international prestige of being in Washington, D.C. So American University represents a lot of different layers of opportunities that they're excited about. Um, and then we, I'll share a quote from one of our interviews here. Um, so I'll give you a second to read this. Um, so as the student says, she was looking at local schools, so schools in the area, but and along with just the Washington DC component, um, she mentions that the internship possibilities at American were um, particularly of interest to her. And then she says, um, I don't want to say conversations were more intelligent, but the conversations were something that I wanted to be a part of. So this was her walking around on campus when she was visiting the school um, and saying that she really wanted to join this community of students that she saw here. Um, she also mentions the global appear, appeal, excuse me, being a Spanish double major. So not only in Spanish, but then also this opportunity of double majoring. A lot of students are like, they want to come to AU because they want to triple major and they see that as an opportunity here, um, which harkens back to this, how much students can expect to take on. Um, and they also wanted to be in the city. Um, so then the next element of their self-understanding that feeds into this idea of prestige is a, is a lot of pressure that they put on themselves and a high level of expectation that they all understand that they have when they come into American. Um, and I've categorized this as global and as local pressure. So global meaning that there is a, um, a larger idea that their university experience isn't enough for them to be successful after college. So just taking classes and doing well in them does not mean that they're going to be successful after college, um, that they'll need internships and other opportunities, as well as a local pressure that um, there are a high number of students getting internships at AU and that they feel competition within their department and within their floors and their friend groups as well. Um, so this next quote that I'm gonna share um, explicates that. So I'll give you a minute to have a look at it. Um, and as she says, pretty much everyone I know has a job right now or is doing something good that will make them look very good on a resume. It's intimidating to think of possibly graduating without internship experience because I'm not really sure how you could even compare to someone who graduated with tons of internship experience or even just one. So there are the two elements there. She mentions that everyone she knows is doing something good. Um, and an important piece to know about this student is that she is a, um, this was in her second year and she was telling me about an internship experience that she got at the end of her first year. So everyone that she knows as in the fall of her sophomore year had an internship. So whether or not that was an accurate representation, that is the way that she was comparing herself to her peers, was that everyone as a sophomore was already doing things for when they're 25. Um, as well as this idea that when you graduate and you're applying to jobs, whether people came from AU or not, that you're not gonna compare if you don't have the same level of perceived experience. Um, and so then I'd like to go into our common challenges that these students had that I um, noticed. Uh, and the first one was a real intimidation and how that 
um, translated into their lack of help-seeking behaviors. Um, and so there, had the, there was a strong theme that students really needed to feel prepared before they talked to a professor or went to um, like the tutoring center or even came to talk to their academic advisor, that coming in without knowing wasn't where, that they, sh where they should be. Um, and that, that idea of not knowing was a self-failure. Um, and then I'll share this in the quote that I have here. Um, and this was from a student that when she was a high school student, she had experience at a community college taking classes, um, but she noticed that once she came to AU, she was thinking about college in a whole different light. Um, she said, I guess at the university level, I felt intimidated by the other professors. And so when she had an instinct to go to office hours after struggling on an um, assignment or something along those lines, she goes, no, I should try to figure this out on my own rather than seeking help. Um, and so that can contribute to a lot of uh, procrastinating with talking to people or asking to help um, and really psychologically messing with those help-seeking behaviors. Um, and then the next quote is from a student kind of explaining why she feels like her and her peer groups might not visit office hours. She says, I guess one of the reasons people don't go to office hours is because they don't feel prepared. Um, they feel like people with their doctorates don't have time to talk to little old me. Um, and I think that people don't feel, I guess, worthy to talk to their professors or they don't feel like they have something to offer. Um, and I think this is a really interesting quote because in the middle section there, she also mentions um, maybe you didn't finish the readings or maybe you didn't do the readings at all, um, which is a very important thing to think about that students, you know, for whatever reason, don't always complete all the work and that, that can this intimidation level can be a, a shut off for them rather than it's okay that I didn't do it this time, but I can try harder next time. Um, and so then, the last element of our common challenges that I want to talk about is this expectation of your social experience. Um, and this comes from a lot of AU, uh, AU students are very high achieving students. Um, I think as was kind of touched on by some of the uh, things that you shared, high achieving in high school. Um, and there's an expectation that being a high achieving student in high school, that college is just gonna be the time where you shine. Um, and so there is this, there's so much excitement coming to college that then there's kind of a, a questioning of why they are not immediately happy and satisfied with their college experience the second week of school. Um, and I'd like to share another quote um, that I think explains that well. Um, she says, and in speaking of how it's more difficult in college to make friends than it was for her in high school, you don't expect the system of college um, to really affect making friends, but it does. I think we're told a lot that college will be so much better than high school, college is supposed to be the best four years of your life, and college will automatically be great just because it is college. Um, so there are all these ideas that are swirling around in their heads of, I'm at college and it'll be great. Um, and I think that it's a very unique uh, position to AU where these students are, they're highly motivated and they've been told that they'll be successful. Um, and it translates um, in the next quote into sort of these um, negative thoughts of self-worth with how the social acclimation <laughs> is going to be challenging. Um, she says, the idea that college should be great and college is my time kind of fed into that expectation that something is wrong because I'm not having the same friend experience that I had in high school. <laughs> because um, it delivered in the academic set, it seemed like there was a problem with me that it wasn't delivering in the other set. Um, so this idea that it shouldn't, or that the, the difficulties in making friends and reacclimating to the social life um, isn't a natural process, but is something kind of self-sufficient um, with the student. Um, and so those are the main themes that I saw um, as far as students' expectations of themselves, their understanding of their first experience, as well as their sort of main challenges. Um, <laughs> and I know that we've already had some time for group discussion, but it would be interesting if, if any of this resonated with you or if any of it is confusing or if there's anything else that you kind of like to share with your own experience working with these students. I see some nods, that's nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Um, well, I think that the, that mention of the living room of seniors is actually a really great transition for this idea of how, in this very unique experience that first-year students have, the peer peer relationships form a really um, interesting role. So another part of um, the like living learning communities is not only being on the floor with your um, fellow classmates, but also um, traditionally having a program assistant, so another peer who's a sophomore who can come and kind of help you out. Um, and that was a, a relationship that we were interested in investigating within the peer advising program. Um, and we really did find that there is something unique about that peer role. And the first one, um, the first theme in that section is this idea of a rehearsal um, for these intimidating conversations. Um, and so I think uh, what I really noticed is that people were, uh, students were responding that their conversations with their peer advisors made them um, more comfortable speaking to their academic advisor, to their faculty advisors, um, and to their professors in office hours. And that there was this element of um, not only sort of practicing what you were gonna say and hearing about other people's experiences, but also um, about the thought process development of um, thinking and asking questions. Um, and I think our next quote will highlight that really well. Um, she mentions, it's really nice to have someone who isn't embarrassing to come to you with a stupid question. I felt more comfortable asking questions that I felt were a little bit more surface level. I wouldn't feel comfortable going into my academic counselor with questions that I thought weren't very collegiate because I'm not comfortable going to an adult with something I don't think that they think is very important. Um, and I think that there, this quote is really, it illustrates a lot, especially with the idea of um, perceptions that students have when they're students. Um, specifically of the idea of what <laughs> validates uh, what validates their questions, what validates their thought process. Um, so even though, as the quote you can see, she says, after the stupid question comment, she says, even though there are no stupid questions. Um, so she knows, <laughs> she has this rational thought process that she's like, okay, I should ask these questions because I need to know these things. But there's also this problem of um, still feeling, still having that feeling that there's something wrong with who she is and that she's not where she's supposed to be. Um, and practicing that out and rehearsing that with a peer can really help break down those perceptions and come to touch with the real issue, which is needing to ask questions. Um, and this isn't in the quote, but a little while later, she mentions that in her second appointment with her peer advisor, she didn't feel like she needed to come in with a list of questions that she wanted to ask. She felt like she could come in and talk about what she was going through and independently think through what she needed to know um, and, and ask questions that came from that conversation which if you think about it is a really important um, growth in the way that students are thinking. So rather than coming in and knowing all the answers, having independent, uh, thoughtful discussions about what they're experiencing. Um, and then our final role here is modeling realistic expectations. So again, cutting through what is perception um, and what is often myth about college and what you should be experiencing <laughs> and um, meeting students where they're at and showing how varied the student experience really is. Um, and this final quote that I'm gonna share is actually from our focus group with our four peer advisors that we have currently. Um, and they mentioned, we always try to bring our personal experience into things. Um, everyone is different and everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. And we try to remind students that this is okay. Meeting with students where they're at, that's what makes us models. Um, so again, just this idea that it's really an intentional relationship that the peers are building, um, which facilitates students coming to them and looking at them not as peers that they need to compare themselves to, but peers that they can model helpful behavior from. Um, so rather than saying, well, my peer advisor had this internship, it's, um, oh, this is a, it's a normal experience for me to have questions and to um, maybe not make all of my friends my first semester. Um, and that whole growth experience gets a lot more uh, normalized through these interactions. Um, so just to reiterate uh, the sort of three points, uh, I guess six really, that we went through there, um, there is the idea, the self-understanding idea, which is that students are excited and they look at AU as a promising place to be, but that they also have large expectations <laughs> of themselves on what they should be accomplishing. Um, their challenges, which is the level of intimidation with the new system and with their um, uh, adult, with the people that they view as adults, um, so whether that's a faculty advisor, a professor, or a counselor, um, as well as that social acclimation process. <laughs> and then finally, the unique role that peers can fill in rehearsing and normalizing what are intimidating interactions for them and setting more realistic expectations um, for their college experience. Um, and with that, I will pass the floor over to Jimmy to talk about some uh, interesting findings. Great. And so 
As an on-campus researcher, I'm interested in understanding the effectiveness of programs that we have on our campus. Uh, as someone that's interested in ed policy just generally, uh, I go back to the points that uh, across the nation there are persistent socio-demographic gaps in achievement in higher education. And while there's been a lot of strides made in understanding what's effective at the secondary and primary school level, there's actually very little done empirically in a real rigorous way to understand what's effective in college. And so uh, this partnership here was a really unique opportunity for me to identify a, a program and also a unique data set uh, and some nice variation in how advisor assignments happen to get at some, what I am going to make as some causal claims about program effectiveness um, and if the, and the peer advising does the job that it intends to do. Um, so here we go. Um, the general strategy is going to be, I'm going to give you what you normally see in, in higher ed research, which is naive OL estimates, uh, um, estimates about program <laughs> effectiveness. So here we're looking at correlation, trying to take into account student background, uh, and then get a sense of, okay, on average, what kind of effects are we seeing? Uh, then I'm going to identify a situation where we identify a discontinuity in how advisors are assigned to show that the, if the exo exogenous variation in that assignment um, leads to ability to make some causal claims. Uh, and then uh, get in back into some research questions and briefly discuss some results. And so we'll start with just some basic, um, uh, th here's the naive part of the presentation. Uh, we can show that just generally in the least specified model to the left, to the most specified model to the right, um, that, uh, the, the, that there is a um, 5.6 to 7.3% increase on predicted retention for students that per participate in peer, uh, in, in peer advising. Um, so again, this is a, a correlational type thing. Uh, we are not accounting for selection at all, so there's a huge selection bias issue question here uh, that selecting to go into peer advising is not uh, endogenous to these results, um, or is endogenous to these results. Uh, the next one is about spring GPA. Spring GPA showed that uh, attendance or uh, participants in peer advising, on average you have GPAs in the spring that are 0.1 five, 1.15, 1.17, higher than those that are not participants. And again, not accounting for selection, but still a really nice correlation that says participation in peer advising um, does have a nice positive impact. So summarize the naive results, about a seven point bump on predicted retention and about a 0.15 uh, points bump on a GPA. So instead of a 3.5, we'd expect a 3.65 for students in the spring semester. Next, the natural experiment that I'm going to describe that exploits this discontinuity and how advisors are assigned is um, if you imagine uh, a student's first letter of the last name as a running variable in which all students are arrayed, where A equals 1, B equals 2, and that's laid out like that. Um, if that's our running a variable, the underlying continuum is, is how students are uh, allocated by their first letter of the last name. Um, the exogenous cut points of how advisors are assigned into treatment or control conditions are determined by the firm coordinator. Um, and it's by a just strict quartile of the alphabet. Uh, and so what we end up with is that advisor student assignments are made quasi-randomly as each advisor is assigned to a specific quartile of the distribution of alphabet uh, sorted by student's last name. Uh, and so students can choose whether or not they select to go to advising, but they don't select who their advisor is. And so that alone might not be interesting, but what I try to do is say, what else does that tell us? So conditional on a student's sex and placed in the distribution alphabetically um, that whether students are assigned to a same-sex advisor um, is as if random, okay? So that's really interesting. So I can get the effect of a demographic match or mismatch uh, when it comes to an advisor assignment. And so if you believe this case that assignment itself is as if random, then even more as if random is gonna be the assignment to a same-sex or different sex advisor. And so this will allow me to back, oh, so there you go. This will allow me to back into some research questions um, where Practically, as a point of practical consideration, we're interested in question two the most, right? We want to know what's the effect of, uh, <laughs> of uh, peer advising on outcomes. But to get there, we actually work through this same sex, different sex, um, demographic mismatch component. Um, and so the first question is how does revealing the gender of a peer advisor and an emailed invitation to students participate uh, increase their likelihood of taking up the program? Um, and then the second question is, is the program itself effective on certain academic outcomes? So for the question one, I see that there's a pretty massive impact on male student participation in the program when they're invited to participate in the program by a male peer advisor. And so whereas uh, on average, male participation program is below that of female um, students, uh, when they're invited by a, a male advisor, we see that um, participation increases to up over uh, the female participation rate. So um, about a 40% increase on even how females participate in the program. And then compared to being invited by a female peer advisor, we see that they're 60% uh, more likely to come up and take up the program. 
And so at AU, that's a really interesting finding. But broadly, when you think about how do you get more men to take up programs generally um, in uh, primary school, <coughs> secondary school, and post-secondary, there's something in how you invite students to those things that can have a real nice effect on that take up. And so whether a program is effective or not, I guess the first barrier you want to try to cover and, and clear is can I get them to show up? And so this is one way to get students to show up uh, at rates higher than you might expect without this kind of consideration. The second question I look at is through program effectiveness. And here, um, I, I'm looking at reduced form estimates of, of um, being invited by a same sex or a different sex advisor to um, uh, outcomes. And so not the outcome of take up, but the outcome of higher GPA and higher um, retention into the second year. And here I see strong evidence of uh, significant positive effects on retention and on spring term GPA. And then interestingly, they are similar in, in magnitude and significance and size to the estimates that I calculate naively just with um, straight um, um, a linear probability model with OLS. Now going into the next part of question two, so the case that I'm making here is that you know, there's no other mechanism by which the gender of a randomly assigned advisor could affect outcomes other than through increased use of peer advising, right? And so that's how we get at the fact that is peer advising effective? It, it is the link between being assigned a same-sex advisor going more often and having better academic outcomes. The thing that happened in the middle is peer advising and exclusively peer advising in my setup. And so that's how we start to really get at is peer advising effective controlling for issues of selection into the program. So therefore the re reduced performance results are suggestive of a causal relationship. And the next steps I'm gonna use is um, I'm gonna use an instrumental variable approach to look at the same sex advisor as a dichotomous you know, binary variable and instrument that for participation in the advising program to try to control for the endogenous selection of, um, uh, uh, of uh, into the program and to try to eliminate some of that to get unbiased estimates of the true effect. Um, so in summary, I think there's consistent and accumulating evidence that peer advising is effective in improving outcomes. Um, the interesting finding about behavioral nudges, I think can have just general practitioner relevance to folks across campus. Um, related is that, that there's potential male implicit bias against female um, peer health. And so uh, from a take-up perspective, exploit that to get them to come in. But then from a, like, just being a good person perspective, try to <laughs> you know, uh, help them to, to not have that kind of bias uh, <laughs> so that, that they can be um, receptive to help where it comes from. And then for future work, it, you know, formally estimates these effects using uh, instrumental variables. Um, uh, there's an interesting potential project with racial mismatch. Um, one of the names in each year sounds a bit more uh, non-white than the others, and so there's less research about the non-whiteness sounding of names than it is people being able to pick up gender off of the name, but there's something potentially there. Uh, and then also long-run outcomes. So uh, are these effects recursive through the second, third year, and towards graduation? And so I'm interested in that as well. Uh, is, that, is that it for me? So yeah, so okay. I'll, I'll stop there. And any questions at the end to talk about the strategy and all that? I'm happy to field. Um, so, and just as a note, that that, that the, the data that Jimmy had was three years worth of peer advising uh, program participation data that is tracked all by um, a program assistant. So, um, really fortunate to be able to have Jimmy take a look at, at that um, data. So, uh, to kind of tie into, so what are we trying to really say here in terms of, uh, you know, working with first year <coughs> students is really making the case that these intentional peer relationships can be very effective. Um, and, you know, we're not, though, trying to say, like, well, maybe you should now just get all male, male students <laughs> to be uh, peers. Right. Um, there are some important considerations to, to sort of take into effect. If you are somebody that's interested in, in starting to build or develop um, students in, a, in sort of a peer capacity. Um, and so in terms of thinking about what kind of student would make an effective peer, the qualities that I list there, that's really what I look for when I'm selecting peer advisors, um, is having some capacity for reflecting on their own experience of really thinking about their own growth as a student because that's the power of peer advising that when I train these peer advisors, I tell them to talk with these students about what they've learned as students so that they can say that it's okay to fail or yeah, that happened to me um, and to be really intuitive about their own experience and really being able to admit when they don't know somebody. We really actually don't want the know-it-alls to be in a, in a peer capacity because their ability to ask questions also then shows their um, their capacity for growth in these roles and openness to the things that, that we really want them to be working with students on. Um, uh, and empathy is huge in terms of that relatability with students, um, and they really do need to be self-motivated as well because this is, a, this is different than just sort of a, a student, a, a, a sort of random student job on campus. Um, these, this is a unique kind of 
role and, and comes with a lot of responsibility. And so these students really do need to be self-motivated. Um, the another second point there, um, which I kind of talked about from the beginning, but want to underscore again, is really allowing for the ideas of the peers to take the lead. Um, this gives them a sense of ownership of this role, and that's why they do such quality work. Is because they really do that sense of value in their work and the fact that we value it and we advise in office then translate to them doing higher levels of work that, that really can make an impact. But it's showing them that their ideas matter um, and constantly then checking in with them about what their thoughts are, what their ideas are, and what feedback that they have for me about where they want to see this program grow. Because again, that's how we stay in tune with this first year experience. Um, and then really making sure that, these, that this is a unique resource. Peers are not meant to be sort of the replacement to uh, a professor or replacement to an advisor. Oh, if your advisor is not available, go see a peer advisor. Um, it's really fitting a whole other space that um, is a need for students in terms of a kind of resource that can help them effectively transition um, in, in their first year and, and sort of find more success broadly um, in their experience across campus. Um, so I, I'm glad that the, the UC was brought up because we just wanted to highlight a couple uh, other examples of the ways that peers are, are sort of uh, integrated within AU because we're not obviously trying to say that you should just go out and create a peer advising program. I'll take care of that part. Um, <laughs> but the, so uh, Bill Davies, who's a faculty member within the School of Public Affairs, um, he created a peer-led reading group. And the link here oh, yeah. is to an article that he wrote about his uh, reading group that he did. And do you want to describe, because you had a little bit more familiar with like, the structure of what that was? Yeah, so I mean, the, the general gist of it is that he taught um, Introduction to Western Legal Traditions, which is just an intense level of reading that the students weren't ready for, nor did they execute in a, in a satisfactory fashion. Uh, and so um, he created reading groups where a, a previous student would lead gr small groups of students and outside of the class um, groups to, to work through the material. Um, and then he found just incredible impacts on the student engagement, participation, and also uh, products so that, that they would produce as far as essays and presentations, things of that nature. Yeah, and I think his, um, the last uh, sentence here in this article is, is great because it kind of is highlighting what we're talking about, but he said, it's been my experience that incorporating peer learning environments into, cl into class appears to be of great benefit to everyone involved and others being real, uh, and offers gains in yield and efficacy that should be unquestionable. Um, so that was one that we wanted to make sure that we highlighted. Um, and then Joanna um, talked with the folks in the Writing Center um, and can talk a little bit about that and also the UC. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, I had the privilege of working a little bit with the Writing Center um, in the beginning of the semester. We always try to um, blend similar programs, so uh, you know, share knowledge and make sure that we can refer out. So if a student comes to us and we say, oh, you should go to the Writing Center, we can talk about it um, in the most you know, uh, well-known way and that we can really recommend it um, as a good resource. Um, and so um, the Writing Center, if, if you're not familiar with it, is um, it's in the library and it's um, run by um, Jeanette Otten and she um, manages this whole team of upperclassmen through graduate students who meet one-on-one -on -one with um, their peers and do writing help. Um, and it's been this really great resource at AU that's sort of been able to assist at um, the freshman intervention level where they can't read, the they don't understand how to respond to an essay prompt um, when they don't know what a thesis is, to graduate level work where you're putting together um, a presentation or um, a conference paper and you need to make sure that you're, um, you're writing in a way that like flows and that everyone can understand it. So it's been able to meet people, again, at where they're at. So if the question is, how do we help students with writing, then um, tapping into the students that are already leaders and that can be good resources for them um, has really proven to be a good um, <laughs> resource. And the Writing Center um, actually has, they've, they've published on this, they've done some research. I think that they actually did a talk at the Ann Faring Conference last year on um, how, how to write so that students can understand the prompt that you're giving them. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, again, it's an area where these ideas are really coming into play and people are, are um, finding really good examples of how this helps students. Um, and then also I, I was able to meet with um, Andrew Brenner and Nicole Davies over at the um, University College system. And um, that system is where it's the, one of those living, living learning communities. So a student will <laughs> elect to live on the same floor as members of a um, general education class and that they're, they'll have a PA who's usually a sophomore who took the class before, really understands and engages the material, but then also helps them with the holistic development experience of their freshman year. So there are Wednesday labs where it's um, curriculum enrichment, 
as well as um, office hours on the floor that are much more accessible to the student. Um, and it's like, oh, this is what I struggled with when I went to that class, or yeah, this reading was really hard, maybe we can work through it together. <laughs> um, and another note that Andrea Brenner really um, pushed was that the PAs are trained extensively, so they're given um, over the summer a wide amount of training on sort of connecting to students emotionally and dealing with crisis situations um, in a way that faculty members aren't um, because they're faculty members and have other things that they are very ex <laughs> they're experts in. Um, and so there are a lot of instances where students who would have otherwise fallen through the cracks, as they said, can kind of get picked up through these PA relationships. So whether that's a student who's struggling but isn't comfortable vocalizing that to a professor um, academically or socially, the PAs provide a really good um, network and resource for those students. Just a final underscore, what are they thinking really? Um, so the, the kind of hope that we have as the takeaways is that, you know, we really can't really know only because just when we think you know, it's something else is going to come along because there's no real singular first year experience in the sense that this is always going to be what the first year experience looks like. By the time we're done with this presentation, our information is going to be out of date in the sense that they're going to be experiencing something new. And the first year experience is dynamic and ever changing. And so one really effective way that we have found to stay in tune with these first year students <coughs> is building intentional peer relationships to, to understand how to work with first year students and to help enhance the work that you do with students both inside and outside the classroom. Um, so that's sort of our, our big underscore, underlying, bold, italicized point here. Um, and with that, what is our time? We're at oh, we have great, we have, a, we have enough time for discussion. And so uh, we wanted to then take the end of this presentation to turn it back to you in terms of what you think this means in terms of your work with, with first year students and or any other questions or thoughts that have come up for you in our presentation. Yeah. Sure. So as far as professional advising allocations goes, or peer advising, peer, advising. peer advising, so about 100 students per peer advisor and take over the program on average, about 54%. Uh, and so they saw anywhere between 50 and 60 uh, students uh, during uh, um, the, their time as peer advisor in that academic year. Um, and then as far as the, the generalizability across the units, I believe that the relationships and the, the situations that Joanna de is describing, if that's what's happening in those peer advising appointments, and that is certainly something of value, uh, where you're not replacing um, um, the how-to of registration and advising course sequence, but instead you're preparing students in that first year uh, to, to be better prepared to engage in those circumstances. I think it's wonderful peer-to-peer -peer training that's happening uh, that'll um, make them more likely to, to take up and, and, and use those other services more effectively. Uh, is my read right now, given the information that I've come across. I mean, I, it's, uh, I've been doing this for, for almost eight years now, and I, I'm pretty um, anal about saving and recording everything. Mm -hmm. So I do have it's it very all. Very helpful from a research <laughs> perspective. <laughs> Jimmy was like, can you send me this? Yes. Can you send me this? Yes. Like, I have it all saved and, catalog and um, cataloged, um, you know, in, in terms of being able to implement my model into another school. Um, it actually happened in the School of International Service. Uh, this last, last year was the first year that um, uh, my colleague asked me to And they're seeing a lot of similar positive responses. And I think what's really interesting that they did and I, what I think is really great is that um, also what I did with the program here is that she altered it to adapt to the needs of the School of International Service because the needs of first year students in the School of International Service are just a little different in the sense of how they structure their advising with the, with, um, the major. But I think that's what makes it really powerful is that you, and that I think that's really important that if you are looking to do some kind of peer program, you got it. You have we have the framework and the structure, but then listening to okay, how is this fitting the needs of, of whatever it is that I'm looking to help students with? Um, you know, because when I first created this program, it was a mishmash of my peer advising experience. I was an orientation leader. I worked with the mentorship program at the University of Michigan, and.
and I literally just stole things, you know, because I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. Um, I believe that you can patch things together. And then when, over the years, I started to see what needed to sort of be altered and changed to adjust to the College of Arts and Sciences. And as we flesh out a formal paper that we want to think about putting together for this, as an appendix, we want to do a compendium where we say, I want to replicate this on your campus. I'm going to leverage everything that we're learning from her to try to uh, put it out there to build a body of evidence that's uh, in line with what we're finding to say that peer advising works in a lot of different settings. Program, program associate. Associate. Yeah, so you want to talk about how, what that looks like? In yeah. Well, I think, again, um, I, as Lucy mentioned, it's, it's really always going to be about the needs of the students, right? So I think, um, like, I've been able to have sort of the peer roles. I did the general education faculty assistant, and then I did um, a living learning community. And those are both very different classes with very different needs. Um, and I think that in, in Bill Davies' example, it was something that he, he's been doing this for a number of years, and so he was able to sort of take it as such. Um, but I think it'll, it just goes back to that idea of um, identifying what students' needs are and then finding ways, finding ways to connect students that are able to fulfill that. So um, identifying strong students in your classes, not only students who are high achievers, but students who um, uh, connect to you and are engaged and listening and are um, empathetic <laughs> learners. Um, and then sort of seeking out um, ways that they can um, build these, something like a reading group or um, laboratory help. I mean, it, it'll depend, of course, on the subject. Um, I think also from my own experience as a student worker, I'd say that the most, well, I shouldn't say like, it's you know, totally the most important thing, but a very important thing is support and recognition. Um, and it can be really hard to do, I mean, there is a, there's a professional component to this um, in the sense of like knowing the information to contribute, but then there's also a very emotional labor component to it. And it can be difficult to have that kind of emotional relationship with students and not feel like there is a, um, a support behind you, right? Because there is, there, there are very reflective conversations that you have with students. Um, and so making sure that the, like, you know, I was in, in this role, I had a very supportive program coordinator, which was really helpful to come back to and say like, wow, I just had this really difficult conversation with someone, um, as well as the peer advisors are paid. Um, and obviously it's not always possible to have compensation, but um, the general education faculty assistance program, unless that is no longer an option, I think is a really great way to um, give students the support that they need to dedicate time outside of the classroom in order to meet with these students outside of that. Um, and, and in other ways, I mean, maybe that is just, I know with the professors I've worked with, that is where I'll be getting my letters of recommendation from, and that is a huge, like those relationships and that incentive is huge as well. So I think. Oh yeah, building those connections um, are really important and then supporting in some way. And a quick add on, I think just from talking with like um, Bill Davies and others that have done similar things, it's a clear identification of a, a problem that you are having in the classroom mm -hmm. and then peers being the strategy. I think whenever uh, the peer advising is the goal, it, that, that, mm -hmm. that, that can be, um, it, it's, it's hard to kind of make that happen. But if you have a problem and you think peers can be the solution, then I, I've seen success and be able to formulate things like that. And then, I think this is an obvious one, but previous affiliation uh, mm -hmm. seems to matter a lot. And so previous affiliation with the class or the, the mm -hmm. experience, um, that, that, that sort of a, alumni aspect <laughs> to, to, to the program um, is really important too. Yeah, and just, you know, as my brain is sort of working out, okay, well, what are some ideas? You know, the first thing that I would go to is, well, let's ask the students to say, like, what it is that, that they would need, um, you know, and identify maybe do you have some students that, that kept going to office hours? And just taking a second to kind of do a little brain dump with them. Um, because they, the, the kinds of things that these peers come to me, uh, like with their ideas, it blows me away. And, um, you know, to just, because to just kind of see what's going on in there um, can really then help to figure out how <laughs> then you can utilize them in, in a peer capacity. Yeah, um, no, I think that is a really, 
important point um, that there, I mean, you know, you'll have, so in these interviews even, so if we're looking at that data, people will mention um, that, oh, I have friends that go to office hours because, or don't go to office hours, excuse me, because they work and the office hours are always in times when they can't come. Um, and so that is certainly a consideration if you're thinking um, about ways that to make um, <coughs> office hours more accessible to students, um, like Skype options or uh, things along those lines. Um, and yeah, the, and if intimidation is a problem, I think that that idea of the location and the environment is something to really think about. Um, I spoke on a panel once with a professor and we like got into like a little argument about power dynamics in office hours and um, because I do think that they're in, you know, as a peer advisor, there's always a, or there can be a burden on the person <coughs> that you are, you want to bring them in to make sure that you are accessible and that you try to level the power dynamics as much as you can. Um, of course, if you're an expert and you, right, and there are just going to be things that are there and you want to have a culture of respect, um, but that doesn't mean that things have to feel adversarial. And so there are ways that you can kind of think about that environment as well. Um, but certainly, I mean, there's always that question of, if a student just doesn't want to go to office hours, they're not going to go. Um, and, you know, there is also this element of thinking about the social pressure of college and where students are prioritizing their time. Um, and if, you know, they're like, I really want to, you know, rush this Greek organization, um, which I only mentioned because that's a large amount of time, you know, <coughs> other things might be deprioritized. Um, and so in those situations, I think that there is, you know, to, to make it a priority of student, I think that's something that peers can really do in, in sense of like, hey, I did this and it was really important. Um, but ultimately, it's always going to be a student's decision. But I think that there are ways that, you know, from our, our staff offices, from faculty offices, that we can kind of make it more accessible and amenable to what students um, are how they're feeling. Mm. And real quick, just as, as someone that was invited into their world, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the sense that you get before you even have a conversation with them that peer advising is going to be friendly, helpful, and supportive is, is there. So the, the, the culture has been set up where I, I was expecting to be taken care of and supported <laughs> as I went through this research project as, a, as someone's uh, being invited in. And the, the very ecology, the, the ecology of how they set up their meeting space, I mean, you walk in, you, you kind of like lounge in, you're like, okay, this is nice. <laughs> and then it's, it's side by side, yeah. that, that there's no table mm -hmm, in, yeah. in their office where, where you're like uh, face to face, it's more like kind of a side by side thing. Um, the lighting is good, so there's like, um, <laughs> there's things up on the walls, like it, it just feels like a, a place where I can I can lose some of that intimidated, a feeling intimidated feeling that I might have had walking through the door. All intentional. Yeah. <laughs> it worked, I was, yeah. I was affected. <laughs> It's a labor of love for me, so um, 